morning. I'm Chad Harrington, Deacon of Teaching here at Harpeth, and I'll be bringing to you a message from Luke 19, 28 through 44. Um, I'm excited to share this message with you because it's a fun point in the Gospel of Luke. As a church, we've been journeying through Luke for some good time now, and hopefully you've been feeling the anticipation build. If you haven't, let me simulate that for you as we journey through Luke for just a brief moment with our eye toward Jerusalem. It says that Jesus was in Jerusalem when he was just a boy. You remember that as a boy he entered the temple. And in fact, he got lost from his parents at the temple. And then we find Jesus again at the temple during his temptation. But Luke does something interesting with the way he tells the story of the life of Christ that's unique from the other Gospels. He doesn't record any point where Jesus is in Jerusalem from Luke 4 during the temptation until Luke 19. If Luke was the only Gospel, Jesus didn't go to Jerusalem between his temptation and his crucifixion. It's the way that Luke chose to tell the story. And in fact, in Luke 9.51, it shows the heart of Christ coming toward Jerusalem. It says this, As the time approached for him to be taken up to heaven, Jesus resolutely set out for Jerusalem. That's a lot of chapters between chapter 9 and chapter 19 for Jesus to not go to Jerusalem when he set, resolutely set out for Jerusalem. And Luke is doing something here intentionally because throughout the, throughout the narrative, he says that Jesus had his eye towards the city. Why? Because Jesus knew his destiny all along. In Luke 9, 53, it says, The people in Samaria did not welcome him, for he was headed for Jerusalem. In Luke 13, it says, Then Jesus went through the towns and villages, teaching as he wa made his way toward Jerusalem. Luke 17, 11, now on his way to Jerusalem, Jesus traveled along the border between Samaria and Galilee. And Luke 19, 11, because he was near Jerusalem, the anticipation builds. What is this Jerusalem journey all about? Well, today is the day that Jesus enters Jerusalem. It is the triumphal entry. And just as he's about to enter, he tells the parable of the Minas, which we will hear about actually a few weeks from now. But it's the story of the coronation of his kingship told through parable. And then we get to Luke 19, 28, that says, after Jesus had said this parable, he went on ahead going up to Jerusalem. And that begins our text to today, for today. Jesus enters the building. The king has left the building, they used to say about a, a certain musician. It's the, uh, the opposite effect of that. Jesus has entered the building. The king is now here. So if you would, please stand with me for the reading of God's word. Luke chapter 19 Verses 28 to 44. It says, After this, he went on ahead, going up to Jerusalem. And as he approached Bethphage and Bethany, at the hill called the Mount of Olives, he sent two of his disciples, saying to them, Go to the village ahead of you. And as you enter it, you will find a colt there, which no one has ever ridden. Untie it and bring it here. If anyone asks you, why are you untying it? Tell them, the Lord needs it. Those who were sent ahead went and found it just as he had told them. As they were untying the colt, its owners asked, why are you untying this colt? They replied, the Lord needs it. They brought it to Jesus, threw their cloaks on the colt, and put Jesus on it. And as he went along, people spread their cloaks on the road. When he came near the place where the road goes down the Mount of Olives, the whole crowd of disciples began joyfully to praise God in loud voices for all the miracles they had seen. Blessed is the king who comes in the name of the Lord. Peace 
in heaven and glory in the highest. Some of the Pharisees in the crowd said to Jesus, Teacher, rebuke your disciples. I tell you, he replied, if they keep quiet, the stones will cry out. As he approached Jerusalem and saw the city, he wept over it and said, If you, even you, had only known on this day what would bring you peace, but now it is hidden from your eyes. The days will come upon you when your enemies will build an embankment against you and encircle you and hem you in on every side. They will dash you to the ground, you and the children within your walls. They will not leave one stone upon another because you did not recognize the time of God's coming to you. The word of God for the people of God. You may be seated. Did you notice the word peace come up in that passage? It says, blessed is the king who comes in the name of the Lord, peace. And then Jesus says, as his heart just overflows with compassion on the city, it says, if you, even you, had known on this day what would bring you peace. I like how the ESV translates it. Would you, even you, would that you, even you, had known on this day the things that make for peace? The things. I, I love that for those grammarians out there, the English teachers who edit their students, if you use the word things, you should really find something else for the word things. But sometimes, I will tell you as a book editor myself, sometimes things is the best translation because it covers the most things And Jesus tells the people, oh, if you'd only known the things that make for peace, all of them. One of my favorite names for God is Prince of Peace. And so what I want to ask you this morning is, do you know the things that make for peace? What are they? Now, peace in the Bible is not just the absence of chaos. It is the presence of God's order. And so when we ask the question, what makes for peace, we're asking a Christian question. It's not just any peace, it's God's peace. And I need to tell you that the truth is, peace has not always characterized my life. I moved once a year from age 18 to age 30. That's a lot of moving, a lot of chaos. And at one point, when I finally started to settle down, I filled up this like 28-foot U-Haul full of stuff. And I was like, man, where did I get all that stuff? And we filled it to the brim, and I thought, oh, man, when I have to unload that, that's going to be a bear. That is, it was chaos, man. It represented for me a season of journeying and trying to figure things out. But it was also a season of a lot of anxiety for me. Can anyone relate to that? Just seasons of anxiety, just chaos. And a lot of times our inner turmoil comes from our external disorder. So, for me, my journey towards the peace of God has been very personal. And... It wasn't just external chaos, but I I really did struggle with anxiety. But I'll tell you, just kind of the short version of the story is, the resolution of my deep struggle with anxiety and lack of peace, you know that abiding peace? It was coming to really trust in and know the sovereignty of God. I knew it at a mind level, but when it hit me at the heart level, oh man, he is truly in charge. That settled this right here. Panic attacks. Now, I haven't had a panic attack in a long time, but I will tell you the last panic attack I had was about four years ago. We were trying to buy a house and we had 10 minutes to make an offer. I was walking around the apartment complex with Rachel. You remember that? It was rough. I mean... I was like, I haven't, she's never seen me have a panic attack before, like I used to when I was younger. She's like, okay, now I know what you were talking about. So that was my last, really, panic attack that I can remember. But God has truly settled this heart with deep 
abiding peace. Do you know his peace? What are the things that make for peace in relationships? Oh, man. Trying to control other people's reactions and interactions? Yeah, that don't work. Celebrate Recovery does a great job of teaching you that in a deep way. What are the things that make for peace in relationships? Can anyone say conflict? Ooh, that don't make for peace. Well, it can actually. See, peace isn't the absence of conflict. It's having appropriate relationships around disorder so that you can work things out. What about your time and your schedule? What are the things that make for peace with a long to-do list? Chad, if you, could, if you could order, if you could fix that one, that'd be great. Yeah? Anyone have a long to-do list? They wish that that could be peaceful and ordered. What about your financial life? The economy's been wild this year. I mean, I try not to look at it, and I really don't that often, which, which I've heard is for my good. The financial people in the room say, yeah, that's probably good. You need to know about it, but not too much, you know. What are the things that make for peace with regard to your financial future? What are the things that make for peace with regard to health? Your health, like your body, your mind, your spirit. And how does Jesus' sovereignty answer that really practical question of, are my kids going to get sick this winter? They probably will. I'll just go ahead and say it. You can do all you can, and you should, but, but now with two young ones at home, sickness sometimes comes. In the midst of the chaos, where's the God of peace? When the best you could do is hang on. Last night, my email got hacked again. This actually happened. And from 3 p.m. to 6 p.m., I was like, ah, I was seeing the spam email autoresponders come back into my inbox, and I've, I was really out of my mind about it. I was like, no. And I was going to even go to a play with my daughter. I couldn't go because when you get hacked on your business account, it can wreck your business. So Rachel got to go to the Lion King with Emma last night, and they had a great time. But I was, ah, what are the things that make for peace in the midst of the chaos? And how does Jesus' sovereignty answer an email hack problem? What are the things that make for peace with regard to politics? I'm going to let that one hang a little bit. My goal today is to help you find the pathway of peace by seeing the sovereignty of God in the person of Jesus. Let's go back to the text. It says in verse 28, After Jesus had said these things, he went on ahead going to Jerusalem. As he approached Bethphage and Bethany at the hill called the Mount of Olives, this is pretty cool. I discovered that the Mount of Olives was significant for the people of God with regard to the coming of the Messiah. Check this out in Zechariah chapter 14. A day of the Lord is coming when the city will be captured, the house is ransacked, and the women raped. Half of the city will go into exile, but the rest of the people will not be taken from the city. This is talking about the exile, the Babylonian, the Assyrian captivity. And then it says the Lord will go out and fight against those nations. As he fights in the day of battle, on that day, his feet will stand on the Mount of Olives, east of Jerusalem, and the Mount of Olives. On that day, living water will flow out of Jerusalem. The Lord will be king over the whole earth. On that day, there will be one Lord, and his name, the only name, the land will be inhabited. Never again will it be destroyed. Jerusalem will be secure. When Jesus comes to the Mount of Olives, the people had the Mount of Olives as a representation for the path of the coming of the Lord. 
verse 29. Jesus sent two of his disciples saying to them, go to the village ahead of you. And as you enter it, you will find a colt tied there, which no one has ever ridden. Untie it and bring it here. And it's like, okay, that's kind of a strange request, Jesus. But not so strange when you read the background in Zechariah chapter 9, verse 9. It says, rejoice greatly, O daughter of Zion. Shout, daughter of Jerusalem. See, your king comes to you, righteous and having salvation, gentle and riding on a donkey, on a colt. And it's the fowl of a donkey. And the, the Greek version of the Old Testament has the word a new colt. And that's why I believe Jesus asked for one that had never been ridden. He is intentionally fulfilling Zechariah 9.9. He is saying, your king is coming to you. If anyone asks you, why are you untying it? Tell them the Lord needs it. I love this part of the story because I could totally relate. So Jesus, as the master teacher, as the great leader, anticipates their questions, their hesitation, their 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 hesitation to obey, right? So you're, if I'm getting you right, Jesus, you just want us to go into the city and we're just going to find an animal and we're just going to take it. Is that right? He's like, that's right. And if someone asks you, what are you doing? Tell them the Lord needs it. Got it. Okay. I'm glad we're going together. Whoever the two disciples were, right? We don't know who they were. What I think this reveals is Jesus' expectation that we will obey without fully understanding. Think about Philip and the Ethiopian eunuch. Do you think he understood when the Holy Spirit told him, as recorded in Acts 8, hey, you see that Ethiopian eunuch reading a scroll? I want you to go run and stand beside him. You know, there's certain types among us who want the plan before we start the plan. It's like, okay, and then what? He's like, no, 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 one step at a time. He's like, okay. So I love that story, right? He's so obedient, so quickly obedient, without understanding. Mother Teresa in her book, Mother Teresa, in my own words, has this great posture towards God. She says, I came to a certain point in my life where I no longer required God to ask my permission in order for me to obey. She got to the place where before she understood it, she was already going to obey. That is the place of the disciples of Jesus here in Luke 19. And the truth is, it's kind of annoying when we're leading people and they have to understand everything before they do it. You tracking with me? If you've, if you've ever been around kids at a certain age, they want to ask why, and it's totally natural. And in fact, it's part of their development, right? They want to, they're developing reasoning. They ask why. And we sometimes do this with God our Father, right? And there's, there's something good to that, but there's also a danger with it. As we grow in our trust of the Father spiritually, we get to a point where we, we can't ask why, and it's good to understand why, but only in its rightful place we no longer need to ask why in order to obey. The truth is, we trust and obey, and then we learn why later, if ever. That's the posture of a disciple of Jesus, and this story is a great example of it. So the problem is really not God's reasoning, it's trust. Do you trust God's sovereignty enough to obey without understanding? Now, one of the things that's a challenge is, well, was it God who spoke to me? And so here's my rule of thumb, my practical advice for you this morning. If, if you're the kind of person, you're, you're, by the way, this is a great place to be, by the way. You're like, I think I'm hearing from God or I want to hear from God, but I don't know if it's his voice. This is a very practical piece of advice. If you think God is telling you to do something and it's not harmful, like there's no risk of harm, just inconvenient or lack of comfort, just do it and find out. That's how I've learned spiritually to discern the voice of God. And what's really cool is when you're like, was that God? Um, there's really not a lot of time to analyze it. Then you just go. And then after you obey, you're like, oh, that's why. And that's exactly what we find with those servants. Verse 32, it says, those who were sent ahead 
found it just as he had told them. They're like, there's a cult here. It's never been ridden, <laughs> you know. And then they were prepared. It says the owners asked them. By the way, the word for owners here is lords. I think there's a play on words. They asked them, why are you untying the colt? And they said, what are we supposed to say? The Lord needs it. The Lord needs it. Okay, okay, we're just going to do that. Okay, well, it worked, which is really cool. We don't know which city this was, Bethphage, Bethany, Jerusalem. But whoever it was, I believe, just sort of piecing things together, that those two were disciples. And they knew who the Lord was, and they, they said, all right, I don't understand. That's my cult, but okay. It's like, here's the keys to the Cadillac. I mean, wow, trust, man. Uncomfortability is a huge barrier to obedience. Do you let your lack of comfort hold you back from obedience? There's always that twinge of self that's like, oh, do I really have to? When the kids are crying at night, for, this is my tr challenge right now. It's like, oh, should I, do I really need to get up or could Rachel do it? And more often now than, than even a few weeks ago, I'm like, yeah, that's my turn, you know. Praise God, right? <laughs> the pathway of obedience, the pathway to peace is trust. And then action. And then more trust. And then more action. That's, how else do you build trust? I love how Mich our own Michelle Eagle stated this. We had Sermon Club this week. She said, the more you're obedient, the easier it is to be obedient. Amen? Isn't that good? It's called trust. And you know what? You're allowed to grow in trust. You don't have to start out fully trusting. Isn't that good? You could be like the man who said to Jesus, I believe, but help me with my unbelief. Verse 35 says, they brought it to Jesus, this colt, and they threw their cloaks on the colt and put Jesus on it. As he went along, people spread their cloaks on the ground. Now, this is, this is neat. It says in 1 Kings 1, that King David said to the, his servants, take your Lord's servants with you and set Solomon, my son, on my own mule and take him down to Gihon. There have Zadok, the priest, and Nathan, the prophet, anoint him king over Israel Blow the trumpet and, and shout, long live King Solomon. What Jesus is doing here in Luke 19 is he is claiming to be king even after Elisha secretly anoints Jehu in 2 Kings 9. We see this at play. It says, they hurried and took their cloaks and spread them under him on the bare steps. Then they blew the trumpet and shouted, Jehu is king. Both putting him on a donkey and putting the cloaks on the ground are symbols of submission to the new king. And so when this happens, it is clear. Jesus is claiming to be king. And when he came near the place where the road goes down to the Mount of Olives, the whole crowd of disciples began joyfully to praise God in loud voices for all the miracles they had seen. Blessed is the king who comes in the name of the Lord. Peace in heaven and glory in the highest. Can you hear the Christmas bells ringing? Luke chapter 2, verse 14. From his birth, we hear, glory to God in the highest from the angels, and on earth peace to men on whom his favor rests. The anthem of his kingship sounded at the beginning of his birth, and now during and leading up to the coronation of his kingship, we hear the prince of peace is coming, glory to God in the highest. The main point that I want to say today is this. Find your peace in King Jesus. The king's coming. And for us, the king is here. There's a lot of options for peace and security. But what I want to say to you, dear brothers and sisters, is find your peace in King Jesus. 
and he deserves our everything because the pathway to finding our peace in him is through practical and simple obedience. So how do you do it? Well, the first thing I want to say is he is worthy. He's worthy of our wild obedience, our blissful ignorance when we hear clearly the word of God to obey. He's worthy of our cult. He's worthy of our cloaks. He's worthy of our blessing, our praise, and our glory. And he's even worthy of our criticism that we receive from other people, which is exactly what happened in verse 39. It says, some of the Pharisees in the crowd said to Jesus, teacher, rebuke your disciples. And I like to believe that he smirked a little bit and he said, I tell you, if they keep quiet, the stones will cry out. The king's here and you can't stop them. Because he knew that this was his destiny. Verse 41, as he approached Jerusalem and saw the city, it says he wept over it. The compassion of the Lord comes out of Jesus' heart and through his tears. And he said, if you, even you, had only known on this day what would bring you peace, and now it is hidden from your eyes. There's only three times in Scripture where Jesus weeps. It's at Lazarus' death. It's in the Garden of Gethsemane, according to Hebrews 5. And here. These are important tears. Do you feel them? Can you hear them? In the place where a king of this world, which still exists, by the way, right? In England? where a political ruler of this day would be welcomed into the cabinet, welcomed onto the throne, and with a smile of arrogance might say, now it's my turn to have power. But what does Jesus do on the way to his coronation? He weeps over the people. If only you had known. God's coming to you, friend, is compassionate and caring. Good, at the very moment where you expect a harsh answer and just treatment for your disobedience, he comes in with tears and he says, if only you had known. But you can't see it. Jesus had the heart of a parent, the heart of a father, the heart of a mother who weeps over their children who are living in chaos. Do you know the things that bring for peace? It's not getting everything ordered perfectly on your own. It's not getting your future plan straight only. It's not the absence of chaos or having enough money in the bank or getting the right person in the office. Our efforts towards those can help, but without Christ as our king, none of that matters because Christ's Sovereign reign is the source of our peace. And as we enter the holidays, we can remember that. And so the pathway to peace, I want to say this, is the way of obedience. How do I have peace, Chad? How do I have peace, God? It's plain and simple. The pathway to peace is obedience. But he is the one who gives the peace. He's the prince of peace because that's what he dispels. That's what he brings. And the very, his very heart as he entered Jerusalem was to bring peace to the people. And so what I want to say to you is, as you think about your life of relationships, what are the things that make for peace? Allow Jesus' reign to impact your relationships. Ask for and listen to his voice, and then just obey. There is this amazing peace that comes, what I want to say next is, through the protection of obedience. When you don't know what to do, and you ask God for his reign to be actualized in your life, there's so much peace to that. I love it. It takes all the, the guesswork out of it. If you ask God what to do, you discern his voice, Maybe get counsel and read his word through prayer. And you know what to do. You just walk in it, man. And then you let go control and it's done. That's it. That's the pathway to peace, man. And he has this shield of protection 
over his disciples. Doesn't mean it won't hurt, doesn't mean it won't be hard or uncomfortable, but there's a shield of protection. And that shield is called peace. Jesus says in verse 43, the days will come upon you when your enemies will build an embankment against you and encircle you and hem you in on every side. They will dash you to the ground, you and the children within your walls. They will not leave one stone on it. <coughs> Excuse me. <clears throat> they will not leave one stone on another because you did not recognize the time of God's coming to you. These are the words that Jesus ends with as he pours out his heart over Jerusalem. These are not words of anger. They're words of comfort and love to say, if only you had known, if only you would have recognized the coming of your king. I want to ask you a question. Where were you in the story today? Were you one of the two obedient disciples at the beginning? Okay, yeah, we'll go. Were you one of the two masters, the owners of the cult? Okay, Lord, there you go. Were you one of the people putting Jesus on the donkey or laying your cloaks on the road? Or were you one of the Pharisees? It's not supposed to work like this. No? Or perhaps you're one of those in the city going about your life, living according to your own ways, with your eyes hidden from the way of the things that lead to peace. Where were you as you heard the story today? I want to give you a chance to respond to the message of God's word, the coronation of our king, the coming of the Lord. And there's, there's really just sort of two postures of response today. Respond however you see fit. But as I thought about Harpeth today, I thought, ask God for repentance for what you know is keeping you from peace. As the things have been spinning in your mind about what makes for peace today, I trust that the Holy Spirit's been speaking to you. And I encourage you to listen to that. Repent so you can come under the shield of obedience which is the pathway of peace. Repent so that you can break through and experience that peace. That's the hope we have in Christ. Also, for you, maybe you're feeling a lack of peace, and I have been in seasons where I'm like, why am I not okay right now? Ask for the revelation from God about what's going on in your heart of why you lack peace. Today's response is the time for that. And we're gonna sing, we're gonna sing about King Jesus right now together. And I just I just wanna give you space. Pour out your heart to God. Repent and ask for a revelation today.